Well, we've been learning about being bold. How many are becoming bolder? Three people. <laughs> Some of you need to get bolder about just going like this, all right? So we've been learning about getting bolder. Um, you know, we've been praying, we've been talking about praying bold prayers for our lives, bold actions, prayers like, search me, oh God, you know, search me. You know, when you say that, what is God going to show you, right? That's a bold prayer. Uh, break me, oh God, so God can use us. Um, send me, send me, oh God, send me to where you want me to go, what you want me to do, all those sorts of things. Uh, Pastor Josh, Dr. Zephel, last week talked about bold actions and our, our words and how we use our words for God. And again, we're not talking about being arrogant. I, I don't think any of, one of us like that arrogant personality that comes into your face, right? We're not talking about being abrasive. We're talking about being bold for the Lord. Amen? There's a, a, a scripture we've been reading along the way, kind of as a theme verse, Proverbs 28, 1, and it reads like this, the wicked run away when no one is chasing them, but the godly are as bold as lions. The godly, in other words, they are going to stand firm, right? The righteous are as bold as a lion. The Greek word that's translated boldness is the word parhesia, and it, the word, it, it has a broad meaning, so I'm going to bring it out just a little bit to you. It, it certainly means outspokenness in a good way. It means assurance, right? You, you, you have this assurance. It means courage. It means confidence, a holy confidence. It means to act in freedom and without fear, all right? So that's what we're talking about when we talk about bold. And each week in the series, we've asked you to consider a number of things, but you know, one of them has been the difference between a snail... I think we have a picture of a snail, right? What does a snail do when you touch it, when you touch those little things up here? What happens? They shrink back, right? They shrink into their, their, their shell. Um, so the difference between a snail and a lion, a lion, you know, it, it, you know, it roars in the face of adversity. It, it stands its ground. So God calls us to be bold as a lion for him. Bold as a lion for and we see this boldness lived out in the early followers of the Lord. The early Christians lived this out. In just a moment, we're going to read one of those stories, and, and you're going you're gonna to see what I'm talking about. And, and, and when we read it, you're, it's, it's quickly going to become apparent, this theme of, of boldness as we look at it. You know, the early Christians were bold in their faith. Amen? They were bold in their prayers. They were bold in their actions, even while living under very challenging situations, sometimes under heavy persecution, even meaning facing death. They were bold as lions. And, and my prayer is, if you listen on purpose here, my prayer is that we, you, and, and me would be bold in our time. I mean, you know, we could use that right now. We need to be bold in our time. The church needs to be bold in our time. How many of you have ever told somebody that you would be there for them? You know, no matter what, I'm going to be there for you, and, and, and maybe this happened, you weren't there for them. Have you ever had that happen? You know how that makes you feel? Makes you feel awful, doesn't it? I'll be there, you know, in your moment of need. You just need to know I will always be there for you. And then that moment comes, and for whatever reason, maybe you forget. Maybe, you know, you just don't come through for them. Well, today we're going to look at at least the first part of his story is a person that wasn't there for the Lord when he promised to be there. His name's Peter. How many have ever heard of Peter before in the Bible, right? Peter had this bigger-than-life personality, it would seem, from the Scriptures. He, he and you know, at, at times he was bold as a lion. Even in, in his early years in walking with Jesus, before Jesus is crucified and ascends to heaven and all that, he's bold as a lion. But then he has these other times where he's more like a snail, especially like a snail in this particular story. For instance, Peter brags boldly about how he's going to stand up for Jesus no matter what happens. Even if everyone else leaves you, Jesus, I'm going to stand there for I'm going to be there. I'm going to be the one 
that stands for you, that won't deny you. And then, of course, if you know the story, he goes on to, in Jesus' moment of need, when he's arrested, he's facing the cross, Peter denies him three times when asked, aren't you one of his followers? <laughs> Have you ever done that, by the way? Anyone relate to that? Aren't you one of his followers? Nope. Are you sure you're not one of his followers? Absolutely not. Come on, I know I've seen you. No, no, you got me confused with somebody else. And Peter ends up this broken, ashamed, hurting person as a result. And then something incredible happens to Peter. Something incredible. Though Jesus dies on the cross and is buried, the third day, he rises. The resurrection, right? He's alive, and he goes to his closest followers, which included Peter, um, and, and he appears before them. He appears to them a number of times, but he appears before them alive and well, okay? And, and he, he's not only with them, he fills their nets with fish, reminiscent of other times. This must be the Lord, you know, fills the nets. He does this miracle. He makes breakfast for them, right? I mean, who doesn't like breakfast? Come on, you guys. I mean, Jesus liked breakfast. You got to like breakfast, okay? Yeah, um, but something more than fishing and breakfast is happening. Peter encounters Jesus. Not just Jesus, the wise teacher. Not even Jesus, the friend that he knew. But Jesus, his risen Lord and Savior. And it's in this encounter, Peter experiences this loving grace and restoration like he never comprehended it before. He heard about it before, but now he feels it like no other time in his life. You see, Jesus knows that Peter's heart is broken. Jesus knows that he's ashamed, that he denied him. And he knows that about us, by the way, when we fail. And so Jesus gives Peter opportunity to confirm his love for him. Peter, come on. Do you love me? Yes, you know. And he goes through this process of question and response. And all of it's very purposeful. And that's a message for another day, okay? I can't dig there today. But Jesus leads Peter through this question and, and answer process of soul searching and grace and, and restoration. And then he, he recommissions Peter. He says, you know what? I still want to use you. I still, you love me. I love you more than you can fathom. Go into all the world and, 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 and preach the good news to everyone. I want to use you. A beautiful story. And I, I would encourage you, maybe after this service, go to John chapter 21 and just read about all the details in there. But here's what I want to zero in on today. This is a turning point in Peter's life. From this moment forward, Peter never looks back. He boldly serves Jesus from this moment forward. Now, no doubt he had his bad days. We all do, right? But he never looks back. He literally, church tradition tells us, he died a martyr's death for Jesus while serving Jesus. No longer does Peter look to Jesus as simply a teacher. He looks to Jesus as God. Now, he said he was the son of God, even before all this happened, but now he knows he's the son of God. You know what I'm saying? He encounters the Lord Jesus Christ. Peter encounters Jesus as God, the creator of the universe. Peter experiences the grace and forgiveness and restoration that only Jesus can offer, and he is truly changed. From this point on, we find a much bolder, Peter, in a godly sense, okay? Peter the rock that Jesus said he would be. Peter the lion that doesn't shrink back. And so we discover something. We discover something important. We discover that to be bold, we, mo we must first have a real encounter with Jesus.
I wonder if sometimes we're like Peter. That previous Peter. We believe. We believe in Jesus. His message resonates with us. We want to be safe from our sins, for sure. <laughs> we want to go to heaven. Anybody here not want to go to heaven? Please don't raise your hand. Um, I mean, we want to experience the love and life that Jesus promises, this thriving, abundant life. But I don't know if we truly grasp that Jesus is God. Because if we truly did and understood that the way Peter now does, it would change everything about us. That he has the power to do anything in us and through us. That all of his ways are purposeful and perfect and good. He has the power to forgive sin and restore what's broken. He's God. He can literally make all things new. He can make what's dead come alive again. Yes, absolutely, Jesus is your friend. I don't want to negate that because that's an important part of that relationship that he's full of grace and he loves you unconditionally and all of that. So true. But Jesus is our all-powerful, creating, resurrecting God. And we need to encounter him in that way personally, personally. And you can do that today. At the end of our message, I'll give you opportunity to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Peter had known the friend Jesus. Peter had known the teacher Jesus, even the miracle worker Jesus. But I don't know if it had truly, truly resonated. Now Peter encounters the risen Jesus. And his life is changed. He'll never be the same. Filled with the Holy Spirit, instructed to stay and wait for the coming of the Holy Spirit. Filled with the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God. Peter is now on a mission to make Jesus known to the world. Check out this Bible story that I alluded to earlier. And you'll, I just want you to notice, remember he had denied him. And now we find him here in Acts chapter 4, verse 1, along with John. It says, while Peter and John were speaking to the people, they were confronted by the priests, the captain of the temple guard, and some of the Sadducees. And the Sadducees had been a, a group that was a main instigator, actually, in Jesus' death. These leaders were very disturbed that Peter and John were um, teaching the people that through Jesus there is a resurrection of the dead, which makes sense. The Sadducees didn't believe in life after death, a resurrection. They arrested them, and since it was already evening, put them in jail until morning. But many of the people who heard their message believed it. So the number of believers now totaled about 5,000 men, not counting women and children. I mean, it could have been. Who knows? I mean, we're going to be talking eight, nine, ten thousand 10,000 people now. Of course, 3,000 were saved on the day of Pentecost. I'll talk a little bit about that. The next day, the council of the rulers and, and verse 5, and elders and teachers of religious law met in Jerusalem. Annas, the high priest, was there, along with Caiaphas, John, Alexander, and other relatives of the high priest. They brought in the two disciples and demanded, by what power or in whose name have you done this? And they're directly now talking about a healing that took place through them in Jesus' In Jesus' name. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers and elders of our people, uh, um, are we being questioned today because we've done a good deed for a crippled man? Do you want to know uh, uh, how he was healed? Let me clearly state to all of you and to all the people of Israel that he was healed by the powerful name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene. The man you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead. For Jesus is 
the one referred to in the scriptures where it says, the stone that you builders rejected has now become the cornerstone. There is salvation in no one else. God has, God has given no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. The members of the council were amazed when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, for they could see that they were ordinary men with no special training in, in, in the scriptures. They also recognized them as men who had been with Jesus. But since they could see the man who had been healed standing right there among them, there was nothing the council could say. So they ordered Peter and John out of the council chambers and conferred among themselves. I mean, this is quite a story, isn't it? I want you to think back again. Peter, who denies the Lord, and now we have Peter here. I mean, it's like a, a switch is flipped in Peter from a snail, shrink back, to a lion, right? A lion. Um, Peter went before this huge gathering of people on the day of Pentecost, and he preaches probably the boldest message of all time. I mean, I, I can't imagine. He's preaching, and 3,000 people get saved that day. By the way, when our group went to Israel, we're going to go again in 2020, by the way, October. But when we went to Israel, we stood on the very steps where that sermon was preached. Just amazing. But Peter told them they were, think about this. He tells them, you are corrupt and you need, you, you need to repent of your sins and you too need to believe in Jesus. How many would say that's bold? I mean, these are the people that put Jesus to death, all right? And, you know, in the New Testament church, the Christian church, it just takes off, and, and they are all boldly believing God for extraordinary things. And, 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 and here we find Peter and John. They, they've met a man who's been lame for 40 years. And I don't mean like he wasn't cool. You know, he's lame. I mean, we're not talking about that kind of lame, right? We all understand that. I mean, this guy couldn't walk. For 40 years, everyone would know him. And Peter and John say, in the name of Jesus, get up and walk. And the man does. The man does. And the same resurrection power that raised Jesus from the dead, they saw Jesus use in his ministry, touches this man and he's healed. He, he, he walks, right? And the religious group at the time, what are they? They are irate. Oh, my goodness, we got this going on again. That's what's happening. They didn't want this Jesus movement uh, upsetting their corrupt systems. They were profiteers off of the temple systems that went on. They were getting rich as a result. And so they sent their temple guards to arrest Peter and John, right? Just picture this, this trial. This is what it would be like. The Sanhedrin, the ruling council, they would all be decked out in their, their robes and, and they would bring the accused in the middle and they would circle around them would be the scene and they begin to intimidate them, hurling question after question from this angle and that angle at them and to decide their fate. And there really wasn't a lot they could say unless they gave them opportunity. It might be they're going to decide they're going to get beaten or they're going to be imprisoned or it might even be death, although they'd have to go to the Roman government for that because they were ruled by the Romans at this point. And then one of them asks, by what name and authority do you do these things? Meaning, who gave you permission and the power to heal someone? And, of course, we read their response in Acts 4, 8 through 10. And this is worthy of note, of course. Peter is full of the Holy Spirit. Peter is full of the Holy Spirit and the power of God. He's, he's encountered Jesus, and now he's welcomed God's Spirit to fill him, to empower him, to enable him supernaturally, all right? And, and, we, and by the way, we're going to be exploring this in detail further in June. We start a series on Pentecost Sunday called Asking for a Friend. Asking for a Friend, Who is the Holy Spirit? Peter doesn't hold back here. 
Would you say, are you guys with me? Full of the Holy Spirit, he states who his power and permission came from, and in so doing, he actually rebukes them, all right? He says, that man you crucified. (laughs) Come on. That man you crucified, God raised from the dead. Do Do we get how bold that was? The Sanhedrin hated Jesus, many of them. They had conspired to have him killed, and they were glad he was gone, all right? Problem solved. We're rid of him. But Peter says, you killed Jesus, and he's back. (laughs) He's back. He lives in me. He's moving through me. That's bold. Peter's saying, I'm not the guilty one. You are. Peter, who denied Jesus three times, is now declaring in the name of Jesus, without any shame, boldly, a man was healed by the powerful name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And it's important for us to understand that the name of Jesus truly does change everything. We live in a spiritual time, actually. Um, And that's the good part for the church. We live in a time where people are seeking spirituality. So they're open to spiritual things. I mean, it might be just... Are we losing it? You know, it could be energy. It could be crystals, rocks, uh, God, little g, gods, little g, (laughs) higher powers, all kinds of things. But everything changes with the name of Jesus. The Bible says every knee will bow at the name of Jesus. And we see the response of the council here. They can't believe what they're seeing. They can't believe what they're hearing. They're amazed at Peter and John's boldness. They truly are. For they could see they were ordinary men. No special training in the scripture. They didn't go to rabbinical you. All right? They hadn't been there. These were fishermen, common people. Didn't have that opportunity. So what do we learn here? It's something really important for you and me. God gives ordinary people extraordinary boldness. Now, the Greek word that's translated ordinary is idios, idiotis. Idiotis. Some of you are smiling. <laughs> you know where this is going, right? Some of you do. This word can mean unlearned. Certainly, that's true here. Or unschooled is also true. But the most literal translation for the word idiotis is what? Can you say it with me? Shout it out. Idiot. Idiot. (laughs) So in the minds of these religious leaders, they couldn't believe, certainly that they're unschooled, they're untrained, they can't believe the boldness of these idiots. So that means there's hope for you and me. (laughs) I included myself (laughs) no you're the best of the best you're the brightest of the brightest no idiotis here (laughs) okay but what do we learn we learn that God specializes in using ordinary people like you and me to accomplish extraordinary things Jesus uses ordinary people to do the extraordinary. Come on. Amazing, life-changing things. God loves to use ordinary people. We see this throughout the Bible. Story after story after story is just like this. Jesus loves to take people that other people overlook and, and give them holy boldness. 
God loves to take people full of of hurt and and shame and restore them and give them uh, a bold mission, right, to accomplish God-sized dreams. He specializes in it. He loves to take people who are quiet and, and introverted and use them to change the world. Jesus loves to take the person who's a student, a mom, a dad, a senior, a single person, a career age person, male, female, doesn't matter to boldly rock the world for God. You don't have to have a degree in theology. I mean, it's, you need to be a student of the word, be in the Bible, but you know what you need more than anything else? An encounter with Jesus, the Son of God, to be full of his spirit, to be filled with boldness and power. And you might say, well, boldness for what? I mean, what does that, what does that look like for me, you know, now? We live in a world that needs bold Christians, bold Christ followers, boldness to live as a Christ follower, boldness to offer love and forgiveness in a world that is unloving and unforgiving, boldness in a world that is hurting and needs the hope of of God's love. We need to be bold and not shrink back. Boldness to live with integrity. Maybe you're a businessman and you have an opportunity, or a woman, and you have an opportunity to make a a boatload of money doing something a certain way, but it's questionable. It could be unethical, and so you pass. You pass from it. You pass from that deal because you want to honor Jesus. That's boldness. Everybody's going, you're nuts. That's just business. No, that's boldness. Boldness to value life. Maybe you've had, you've had a, uh, you, you've, you have an unexpected pregnancy, and, and it's not convenient. These life changes rarely are, are they? But you carry that precious life to term. Why? Because God is the giver of all life, and so we protect those who cannot protect themselves. And in the climate which we live in, to stand up for that, we're bold. We're bold. Or maybe you had that abortion, and now you live with that regret. But you need to know Jesus offers forgiveness and restoration, and he recommissions, and and, and he will empower you so that you can boldly now go out and help others who are facing that same decision. By the way, a big thank you from... uh, uh, Snohomish County Pregnancy Resource Center, PRC. Um, you guys brought baby blankets, baby clothes, diapers, all kinds of them. I think we have a picture to show you there. Um, yeah, don't look at the people in the middle. Just look at all the people. <laughs> um, but anyway, they were blown away, you guys. They were blown away. They didn't have hardly any little clothes for boys And so do you know what you're doing? You're encouraging a mother to carry that pregnancy forward. They say, oh, I can make it. There is help. Somebody will come alongside of me, right? God could take ordinary people like you to do extraordinary things. When the religious council heard the boldness of Peter, they were amazed. What were they? They were amazed. Our world needs to be amazed by the church. Why were they amazed? Because ordinary people were doing extraordinary things. They healed the lame man in the name of Jesus, right? They used bold words in their response to the council. They knew they they could be killed or or imprisoned or beaten, but they, they cared more about sharing the love of Jesus. They were bold. You see it. And when we encounter Jesus, when we are full of his spirit, we too can be bold. We can. I'm not talking about weird or cheesy or obnoxious. I'm I'm not talking about bold weirdos. Write that down in your notes. I'm not talking about this present weirdness, okay, as pastor at Westlake, I know, or uh, Westgate says. I'm talking about bold Jesus people. Bold in God's love. 
Come on. That we love boldly. That we share our God's story boldly and unashamed, our Jesus story. That we live with integrity boldly. That we, we give boldly. That we serve boldly. That we forgive boldly. That we extend grace and mercy boldly. That we encourage people boldly. We are bold to live out the ways of Jesus. We're bold to look like him. Verse 13 says, they also recognize them. They also recognize them as men who had been with Jesus. You want to be bold? That's a, that's a question. Then be with Jesus. Be with Jesus. It's one thing to encounter Jesus and accept the love and forgiveness he offers and kind of compartmentalize that. I would call that an event. That's what events are like. There's nothing wrong with events, but that's what events are like. You go to it, it happens, you leave the event. Okay? And it's easy as believers to get caught into this trap. We go to church, it's an event. We go to a special concert, it's an event. And so we kind of go, and, and it has effect, don't get me wrong, but we kind of leave it, right? Everyone wants to go to an event, but Jesus is looking for a relationship, all right? Being with Jesus is a whole nother thing. I mean, being with him. It speaks of ongoing relationships. It speaks of, 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 of loving God with all that you are, your heart, soul, mind, strength. This speaks of, of really knowing and, and growing and becoming, all right? Spiritual boldness comes from being with Jesus. Let me, let, let's understand that boldness isn't the goal. So I'm not getting doing this series with the goal being boldness. The ultimate goal is knowing and becoming like Jesus, who is bold. And because he was bold, changed everything. The, that thriving relationship produces boldness. Are you with me? Boldness is the byproduct of that relationship. When we live in God's word, when we're praying, when we're listening to the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, we become naturally bolder. It's like spending time with a good, capable friend. Uh, operative words there, good, capable friend. Or a new work associate who's also capable, all right? When you first meet them, you don't, you don't really know what to expect. You, you don't know their capabilities yet. We've probably all been there somehow. You don't know if you can depend on them. You don't know if you can depend on them. Uh, however, the more time you spend with them, right, you begin to learn their strengths and, and their, their weaknesses, certainly. But your confidence then begins to grow as, as you get to know them. It begins to grow as they come through in different situations that, that you face together. And now you can start to depend upon them. Uh, you become bolder yourself. It's really because you know they're going to come through. And because they're going to come through, I can now step out in some other areas and I can begin using my talents to take some risks because I know that person has my back. Real simple. Jesus has your back. And he has no weaknesses. There's only upside. When we spend time with Jesus, remain in Jesus, our trust in him grows. Our faith in him grows, and it leads us to a new level of boldness. It's a natural progression. I hope you're seeing that. The more time with Jesus, greater faith, bigger and bolder prayers and actions and words and, and obedience, whatever it is, it's a beautiful cycle. If you want to put that more time with Jesus, the more boldness you have and the more time you want to spend with Jesus. My challenge for you today, and I've already challenged myself, is to take the next step in your spiritual journey when it comes to boldness. 
It could be that you need to encounter Jesus for the first time as your Lord and Savior. That you need to ask him to forgive you of your sins and come into your life. That you desire that gift of eternal life. You desire that home of heaven. And you can respond to him today. And I'll give you opportunity. You can put your faith in him. But that will require a step of boldness. It could be that you've done that, and, and, and you are a committed Christ follower, but you really haven't invited the Holy Spirit to totally saturate you, fill you, overflow out of you, empower you. And so God's saying, you need to open up your whole life to me in that way. I want to baptize you in the Holy Spirit. You can do that, but that will require a step of boldness. It could be that you've settled for kind of knowing who Jesus is. He's your friend and, and all of those sorts of things, but you've really never encountered him as God, the God of your life, all-powerful, all-creating God. Today, you can change that by inviting him to show himself as that in your life, by seeking him every day rather than as an event, right? That, too, will require newfound boldness. Or it could be God's calling you to reach out for him. He's actually calling all of us to reach out for him, to become outward focused rather than inward focused. Our world needs rescue. And it's full of people who are hurting and are, quite frankly, spiritually lost going to hell. And God wants to use you, an ordinary person, to accomplish extraordinary things for him. Just like God used Peter to bring salvation to 3,000 on the day of Pentecost and thousands of others as time moved forward. God wants you, wants to use you to bring healing to those around you, just like he did that lame man. God wants, he invites you to be a part of rescuing the world. God invites you to help meet the needs of humanity one person at a time. God invites you to make a difference. Regardless of your personality type, God wants to use you. He wants a a bold introvert out there. He's looking for a bold introvert. Because there's certain people an introvert can touch that an extrovert can't. Today, let's each take the next step in a life-changing journey with Jesus, shall we? A step of extraordinary boldness. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus, we thank you for loving us and giving yourself so that we could be forgiven and made new and have new life. We really can't express how grateful we are that you died for us, you rose again, you ascended into heaven. And our words can't express our awe either of your resurrection power and who you are. When we encounter you, we just make this declaration, Lord, our lives are changed. And today we want to take the next step in our journey of faith. We want to take an extraordinary step of boldness for you. I mentioned earlier that I wanted to give opportunity for people maybe are here and God's just talking to you, saying, give your life to me. I want to give you new life. I want to give you new purpose. I want to give you the assurance of eternal life of heaven. I want to change your future. I, I, I'm not so much concerned about your past, but I am very concerned about your future. And so if there's anyone here like that, I want to lead you in a prayer where you are, I'm going to ask everyone to repeat it after me, but I want you, if that's you, to repeat it from your heart, okay? You're accepting Christ into your life. You're putting your hopes, your dreams, your trust in him. Would you pray this prayer with me if that's you? Everybody else, can you help them? Here we go. I know I'm a sinner and I need your forgiveness. Lord Jesus, I'm talking to you. 
I believe you died in my place. And you rose from the grave. You rose from the grave to make me new. To prepare me to live in your presence forever. So Jesus, come into my life. Take control of my life. Forgive my sins and save me. I make this declaration. I place my trust in you. You alone for my salvation. And I accept your free gift of eternal life. In your name, Jesus, I pray this prayer. Amen. Amen. Amen.